Just to get a, a, a lay of the room, I'm, I'm Dr. Craig Dale, I'm the Head of Policy and Research at the Think Tank Commonweal. Now, just to get a lay of the room, how many of you know Commonweal quite well, have read our stuff before? Right, how many of you have maybe heard the name? Right? How many of you were aiming for the pub down the road and got really, really <laughs> <laughs> Told that joke in a pub once we were in the, in the wee nook at the side and it happened to be there was one guy who was just up in the bar and seen some interesting people walk into the room and thought that looks quite fun, wandered in. We had him signed up at the end of the night. That's great. So tonight I'm going to be talking about a paper that I wrote last year looking at social security welfare benefits. Right? We use all these terms, they all have their own low-deep connotations underneath them. I prefer the term social social security rather than benefits. Benefits is a really ugly word that it, it just has that feeling of this is something that you're a gift that has been granted to you at the whim of the government with a social security speaks to the responsibility that the government has to you to look after you, to ensure you have a decent life. It is one of the things that comes up that came up certainly in the twenty fourteen uh, independence referendum campaign because it is one of these things that is going to be the most fundamental change in an independent Scotland. We will we'll no longer be tethered to the, the UK's benefit system and we can build a social security system actually worthy of the name. Because the UK's system is broken. At best it's meagre. It's one of the least generous in the, in the developed world. At worst it's outright punitive. You know, thousands have been harmed, have died as a result of sanctions being placed on them by the UK government. So this is something that we need to explore and need to get right. To give you a bit of background on basically the anatomy of a welfare state, the idea that a government has a duty of care towards its citizens started to develop in the 19th and 20th centuries. The key moment in the UK was in 1942, in the midst of the Second World War, with the, the Beveridge Report. This was a report that, that produced the seed of what would eventually become the NHS, the state pension and the welfare system. Three really prized things about the UK. Good reason. They are, they, are, they are valued things and they have done a lot of good. But recently, the UK has taken a dark and quite nasty turn. Since 2010, we've had the Conservative government and their austerity program, and since then welfare has been under attack. How many of you? How many of you have seen the film *I Daniel Blake*? Yeah, see the ones that have, who aren't sticking their hand up, go and watch it. It's horrifying, but it's vital. It's it's the story of a of, of a, a guy who gets trapped in the welfare system, in the sanction system, and you just watch as it breaks him and so many others heartbreaking story, but one that needs to be told. It's, the, the sanctions are arbitrary. I, I've known people who were told that when they went for their job seekers allowance they, that they had a, a job interview arranged and they had to go, had to, go to the job interview and they'd be sanctioned. And they went, they didn't get the job, but then they were sanctioned anyway because, because they were at the job interview, they missed their next, their next sign-on date, which was at the same time and couldn't be changed. You can't win in a system like that. It's designed to make you lose. When we're thinking about new ways, different ways of, I know it's a horrifying story, it gets a little bit better from here on. Um, when we're talking about new ideas, new policies, you need to think about three basic ways that you can, you can think of benefits of types of social security. Um, you've got the, the contribution-based system. This is one where the, the payout is based on the amount that you pay into the system or the time that you spend paying into the system. A good example of this is the UK state pension, which is based on how many years of national insurance you pay. Um, there's the universal system, which is just given to everybody or is available to everybody regardless of the circumstances. And then there's a the means-tested system just based on some need or criteria. So job seekers allowance is paid to someone who is unemployed. You get tax credits who is poor paid to people who whose income falls below a certain threshold. Then we need to think about how the powers 
are distributed in, in the UK at the moment. Uh, right now, Scotland controls about 3% of the welfare expenditure in Scotland, a tiny, tiny sliver. With the new powers that are coming in as a result of the Scotland Act 2016 that came out of the, the last independence referendum, we're getting quite a lot more power. Uh, Scotland will soon control 17% of social security expenditure. <coughs> Yay! <laughs> <laughs> So you can see that under the devolved situation, you now the, the Jim Freeman and the, and the folks that are working on this, they're, do, they're going to be doing a really valuable job, but ultimately all they're going to be doing is tinkering around the edges. The most of what they're going to be doing is basically topping up Tory cuts. It's, it's not going to be revolutionary. It's going to be you know, pretty important if it affects you, but we're not going to be rocking the boat. We're not going to be changing the world with these powers. With independence, though, we can we can talk about the system as a whole, and we can talk about thinking about that system in an entirely new way, build a social security system worthy of the name and fit for the 21st century. So, if we think about what we could do, right, let's take the the least ambitious approach that we can possibly think of. Let's become independent. Go through all that hassle and not change anything. Right, let's just keep the UK system as it is, grandfather the whole system in and basically keep going as we are because you don't want people to have to go through all that hassle of changing. It's a very unambitious approach. Well, even if you do that, you actually still have to change quite a lot. For a start, all of your national insurance numbers, now they're not going to disappear because I, 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 I would hazard that a good chunk of the folk in this room would probably remain UK citizens in an independent Scotland, even if you take on a Scottish citizen on top of that. So you're still going to have your UK national insurance system, you're still going to be due, you know, outstanding UK social security that you may have accrued. For example, your UK state pension. Unless there is a deal to the contrary, you know, the, you have built up rights to a UK state pension, the UK state is obliged to pay that when you retire, or if you've already retired, regardless of where you live, whether it's in the United Kingdom, an independent Scotland, or Barbados. But Scotland can't just keep going with the national insurance system because now you've got two countries using the same system and you've got the risk of people getting two people getting issued the same number. That's obviously not going to work. So Scotland needs a new system of citizen identifiers. Now in the paper we talk about a better way of doing it than the national insurance system, a more secure way of doing it and, and one that gives you better control over your, your personal data. It actually draws on uh, a lot of the same principles that have went into the recent EU uh, GDPR laws that you've all been getting pestered with emails over the last few weeks. But what's the point in becoming independent if you don't do anything with it? So let's think a bit bigger. We could look to our neighbouring countries, especially the Nordic countries, um, and you can look at how much money is spent in various countries on things like health and social care. The OECD maintains a database of how much is spent as a percentage of GDP in these countries, and actually the UK figures barely above average. It's, it's really not breaking waves in, its, um, in the amount it's spending on its people. It's spending about 21.5% of its GDP on health and social care. The average of the Nordic countries is more like 30%, uh, more like 25%. Finland spends about 31%. If Scotland spent 31% of its GDP on health and social care, that would, that would represent an extra £8.5 billion pounds a year being injected into the system do quite a lot with that. They reckon that if Scotland did that, it would cut poverty rates by more than half. Of course, more expenditure, you know, you might, you might be talking more taxes and that's the first thing everyone talks about when you, you bring up the Nordic countries, ah, but they pay more tax than we do. They do. Their prices are higher. Their wages are higher too, so it actually balances out, more than balances out. But, if we look at tax revenue, again as a percentage of GDP, it gives you a nice wee comparator. Scotland gathers about 34% of its GDP in tax revenue every year. The UK is about 36%, mostly because you've got a lot of billionaires in London. 
Uh, the, the Nordic average is about 43%. Then there's Denmark that gathers about 50% of its GDP in tax every year. If Scotland increased its taxes or closed tax, look, tax avoidance loopholes um, to, so it could raise tax up to the UK average, that'd be an extra two and a half billion pounds a year. Up to the Nordic average, it's about 13 and a half billion pounds a year. There's a deficit going. Or if we decided to be Denmark and raised our taxes um, to, to the same level that Denmark does, it'd bring in something like an extra 26 billion pounds a year. Again, you've not just closed the deficit and topped up the health and social care, you've now got a lot more money to play with and other things as well. It's no, no coincidence that Denmark is consistently rated the happiest country on the planet. <laughs> Despite the tax. Or because of the tax. There's something to ponder. So, that's just raw numbers. You, you, you want a bit, something a bit more inspirational than that. So let's let's start talking about ideas. So in, my, in, in the paper that I wrote on this, I started pulling out some innovative policies from around the world. One of them is a, what's known as a job guarantee scheme. Now this is already in place in a few countries like India. It's starting to really make waves in, in some political circles in America. Bernie Sanders has adopted it as his his next big campaigning policy. The idea behind this is instead of giving you job seekers allowance, why not give you a job? Why not arrange things so that the government is the employer of last resort? They will always be able to find a job for you in your skill set, in your area, or what's needed for the country. Now, I'm not going to talk about too much about what jobs they could be because that's quite a very technical argument. It really depends on the area, the, the type of country you are. Um, but some of the advantages are, well, one, you can go from a job straight into another job. You don't have that really depressing lull of searching for jobs, which can be a full-time job in itself. I know I've been there. I think we all have. Um, but it's, it's, it's got secondary benefits as well. This kind of job puts a, a solid guarantee on policies like the minimum wage. Because if you start getting paid less than the than a job under the job guarantee scheme, you quit and you go for the job guarantee. It also guarantees workers' rights. Again, if you're in a if you're in a, a, a job where your boss is treating you terribly and you hate it, then you can get a better job with the guarantee scheme. You don't have that worry of not paying your mortgage. It might also act to address specific geographic imbalances. So if there are jobs, if there are <laughs> If there are jobs needed in certain areas, I'm thinking like the Highlands and Islands, you might be able to, you know, encourage people to move there and say, look, we have a job for you. If you're willing to move, we'll give you the, give you relocation fees. There you go. It might also help in areas. We've all seen them where a town has lost its major employer. You know, we've seen all sorts of cases where a major manufacturer moves overseas or shuts down or whatever. A job, uh, an area loses hundreds or thousands of jobs, and what's the first thing the government always comes out with? Well, we'll, we'll provide retraining packages. Trust me, steel workers don't want to become IT IT technicians. <laughs> so, with a with a properly motivated job guarantee scheme, maybe instead of just looking at people as mobile assets and and skill sets and moving them to where jobs are, why not move jobs to where the skills are? Why not invest in creating new jobs to replace the ones that have been lost? One thing I would say about the job guarantee scheme is it's not a replacement for social security. A lot of people talk about it in this in this way. I'm actually quite against that idea. It is a, an interesting economic policy and the two do link together. But for example, I know people who care for family members. They, it's, it's absolutely what they need to do, absolutely what they want to do, and they want to make sure that they're, um, they're looked after while they're doing it. But they don't consider it a job, and they don't want to consider it a job. They don't want to become paid carers. They just want to be able to live while caring for their family. Maybe a subtle distinction to some, but if, you're, if you've done it, you'll know exactly what I mean. So let's look at another policy. This is a policy that we, 
we could actually maybe do just now. This is the, called the negative income tax. <coughs> now, we're familiar with the idea that if you earn above a certain amount, you pay a certain tax rate on that earning. Right? So if you earn a lot of money, you'll pay a higher, higher rate of tax than someone with an average income. We're familiar with the idea that your income below a certain amount is at zero tax. Well, why not go a step further? Why not, if your income is sufficiently low, you get an automatic tax credit? Now, I, I, I created a, a scenario in my paper where if you earn less than £16,000 a year, you would start to automatically get this tax credit and I set the level so that if you earn nothing, you would end up actually getting the same amount per week as you would on Job Seekers Allowance. So that allows you to eliminate Job Seekers Allowance. You take that social security thing, you take all the administrative structure around that and the sanctions around that, and you fold it into the tax system. You don't need to start sanctioning people anymore. And the payments just happen automatically through PAYE. And you can play with those numbers, you can set them to however you like. You can also replace other benefits like carers allowance or universal credit. You know, universal credit, you know, I don't know if it's rolled out in this area yet. As, have you started seeing the impacts of it yet? Yeah. A lot of fun fact about uh, universal credit. If you're receiving the universal credit and you earn one pound, you won't get taxed on that because you're below the tax threshold, but you'll lose about 63, 63 pence of your universal credit. Now here's a question for the Tories. Why is it utterly, utterly in, unthinkable that someone earning a million pounds could have a 50% tax rate when someone earning a thousand pounds is on a 63% tax rate? That's just wrong. So I, I said that this, is, this might be possible under the, the, the current devolution system because we now have a lot more control over income tax. There are a few difficulties with it, mostly that we don't have control over that personal allowance, so the, the UK government can still manipulate that, and it, it might make it quite difficult to deliver. Um, slight con is, what, if you are unemployed, you would still need to have a tax code, but that's actually just a fairly minor uh, administrative issue. Um, I, 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 I came out with that line at a, a talk recently and someone who actually worked on um, assigning these tax codes said I could basically do that in a week. <laughs> so, <laughs> fair enough, I believe him. Um, to, for, to my mind, the biggest disadvantage of this policy is that it retains that link between income and work. It retains that link between work and worth. So that if you're not working, you are worth less. And that's not an attitude I want to foster going forward into the 21st century, especially with automation coming around the corner. If the fears are, if the worst fears are true, then we might be entering a period where there are fewer and fewer jobs available. It might become, we might hit a point where there simply aren't enough jobs for everybody, whether we want one or not, because the robots have taken them. So maybe we need to look at something else. Now here's a slightly more radical idea that is getting talked about a lot more. You would have got laughed about, laughed at ten years ago if you had mentioned it. Five years ago you would have got ignored. Now people are listening. Who's heard of a universal basic income? Exactly. The idea of this is we don't care what you're earning, what you're doing, what your need is. You get a flat monthly payment, regardless of your situation. Now, if you are earning, you will you'll be paying uh, income tax on that, and you can adjust the income tax and the rates so that at a certain point, you know, you stop becoming a net a net recipient, <coughs> start being, being a net payer again. I mean, if I give you a thousand pounds, but then tax you a thousand pounds, who cares, right? <laughs> um, and this this proposal would actually allow you to get rid of most of the benefit system. It would allow you to fold in things like this, the, the state pension. It would eliminate problems where people are, are, are not receiving a full state pension because they've got a broken work record. Often women who have spent a lot of time bringing up families. <coughs> it gets rid of the problem of governments raising retirement ages arbitrarily, affecting people, mostly women, 
How many waspy women have we got in the room? Yeah. My mum's among, among you. So instead, we just get rid of that, replace it with a universal basic income. You're now secure that you have a minimum income and you know you can cover the basics of your life, the basic essentials. People say, well, what about the folk who are earning money? I mean, why is it fair to give them, give, give them that, especially if you're just taxing it back off them again? Well, again, imagine you're in a workplace and you don't like it there. It's a terrible job. You're getting treated badly. Your workers' rights are getting eroded away. And you can't afford to quit because, again, you've got a mortgage and kids to feed. Yeah? If you can cover your basic essentials, you're free to find the job that you actually want to do rather than the job that you have to do. Or perhaps, and I, I personally have been here, you want to set up a business, you've got an idea, but you've done the numbers and you don't think it'll be profitable for a few years. How do you pay the bills in the meantime? What do you do if it fails? I actually had a business, business idea of my own that I did not take forward simply because I realized that I couldn't afford for it to fail. And that's a bad bet. You don't put yourself in that situation willingly. So just imagine the number of ideas that are floating about in society now that will never be realized because it's just too risky. Something like a universal basic income could de-risk that and you can really transform an economy. Of course, I said it would get rid of most state benefits. It's not going to get rid of all of them, especially things like disability payments. Disability payments are there for people who need an extra hand, an extra help in their life due to, due, uh, for whatever reason. So that sort of thing has to be, has to be maintained. So, as I say, this is an idea that is, is becoming of its time. It's been talked about seriously in places like the United Nations. It's, it's backed by politicians right across the left and right spectrum, although I would caution that it is often backed by folk on the right for very different reasons than folk on the left. Folk on the left look at, look at it as a, a means of reducing survival anxiety and, 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 and just generally improving the lives of everyone. Right-wing folk, especially libertarians, what they see is, well, if we give everybody money, then we don't need to provide them health care. We just give them a check and they can buy, buy private health insurance. We don't need to provide state schools. We can just give them a check and they can buy private education. So I would just caution that while it is uh, backed across this political spectrum, you know, the visions of a society can be very different, even when you put the same policy in place. I would also say that this, this idea is, it has been piloted. It has been piloted. The, the first pilots were happened in Canada in the 1960s. It, there's a pilot ongoing in Finland at the moment. It's starting to show fairly positive results and there's I think three, maybe four pilots being planned in Scotland. Um, they're currently going through negotiations with uh, HMRC and the DWP to, to, to see if they can get these things running. It'll be very interesting to see if they do. It hasn't yet been tried on a, a countrywide scale. I think the closest we've had are are statewide initiatives that are similar, like Alaska has an oil fund that pays a dividend to all Alaskan residents, but that dividend fluctuates with um, the price of oil, the volume of oil, and how much the politicians want to skim off it every year. <laughs> um, but, you know, maybe Scotland wants to be the first country to do this. Maybe it wants to wait and see if some other one go, someone else goes first. Certainly we want to keep exploring it and talking about it. So, that's the ideas, that's the end of the talk. Uh, I would just say that this was essentially a small chapter from Commonweal's White Paper Project, which was uh, designed to reinvigorate the independence campaign by looking at the ideas um, from 2014, looking at the ones that needed to change because circumstances have changed, looking at the ones that maybe we just didn't talk about well enough last time and we can improve on. Um, we've published dozens of papers on the website, uh, allofusfirst.org, that you can download for free, you can, you can read through, and we've gathered those ideas into a book that I'm selling tonight, if anyone wants to buy one, um, called How to Start a New Country, which takes you on a journey, assuming that we have got a yes vote, what next? Because we don't want to be, if you remember after the EU referendum, 
Boris Johnson and Michael Gove standing at the podium in their victory speech looking like deer in headlights because <laughs> they hadn't a clue what to do next. They still don't. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the book takes you on a three-year journey from referendum through the, the, the building process, building all the institutions we need, you know, our central bank, our currency, our civil service, our customs and borders, that's just the seas. Um, and then after the three-year process, once you've got everything built, you become independent and you become a viable nation state. Um, very last word, Commonweal is a, an organization that, is, that exists thanks to the generosity of donors like yourself giving, you know, five and a month. If you go onto the website and you like what you're reading, there is a donate button there. Um, and thank you, and I'm happy to take any questions. That's a really good one. Um, one of the, it's a, it is important to do this right because one of the consequences of moving to a mainly means tested based system where, where you might get a benefit for being on low income plus another one for having kids plus another one for whatever, right? If you, you'll have people in all sorts of different situations, all sorts of different circumstances and then you're telescoping all of that into a flat rate you do run the risk of, of, of suddenly someone who is in a fairly vulnerable position losing a chunk of income and you want to avoid that. So probably the best way of doing it is to introduce it for new claimants, but keep people who are currently in the system on their current system and then just phase them out as, you know, if you're on job seekers, you'll stay on job seekers. You then get a job, you now get the universal basic income, for example. Uh, you could also then split that up, so phase it in by regions like they're doing with universal credit, but you might want to do that because of the problems that they're finding with universal credit. The basic income, it's not so much a cash problem as a cash flow problem, because ideally what you would do is you would balance the expenditure with increased taxation somewhere else in the system. That could be increased income taxes, it could be increased corporation taxes, or whatever. It could be annual ground rent. We are coming up um, to, to, to talk about that. Um, so, it, so it's really more a case of how do you make sure the money goes from A to B to C rather than how do you create it. Um, the system that I have in the paper now is a, I will admit, is a very meager universal basic income. It's set at the level so that if you, you, you would, if you were on job seekers, you'd get about the same as job seekers, or if you were a pensioner, you'd get about the same as the state pension. Um, so it's a very, very low basic income. It's not one that actually you could live on, uh, but I, I did it for that. So you could draw the comparisons with the old system, but also it's quite easy to pay for that particular universal basic income just by tweaking income tax slightly. So the, the, the model that's in my paper is actually what's known as revenue neutral. It wouldn't, uh, you wouldn't need to pull money from some other source other than taxation to, to, to introduce it. If you want a more generous system, you need to think about other ways of uh, not quite balancing the books, but you need to, you need to have other arrangements in there. No, it was always supposed to be designed as a two-year scheme, um, but they applied for an extension, but the extension was rejected, so it's still going to run for the, the, the two years. Now, that is some of the, some of the trickier parts of the policy itself. Um, part of the reason I didn't want to go too much into the detail of what jobs are created where is because to be honest, that hasn't been completely worked out for job guarantee scheme proposals, and it's highly, highly dependent on the, the country that you apply it to. I mentioned India already has it. It does, but it's mostly aimed at women, and it's mostly aimed at uh, digging irrigation ditches and, uh, and, and agriculture. But these are women who otherwise would not have a job at all, um, and it's very successful, very popular. 
it's not a scheme that you could probably transplant to Scotland. <laughs> Unless you wanted to repopulate the Highland Crofts. Depends on the government you elect on Independent Scotland. <laughs> vote for if you don't like that, vote for one who promises to not do it. <laughs> that's that, that's that's right in the realms of your your policy areas. That will be for the party of the day. So I can't make a promise either way. If the Tories if the Tories want to give you give, give you what you want, vote Tory. <laughs> it's probably the only time you'll ever hear that. <laughs> You are assuming, of course, that with declining newspaper sales, these guys are still going to be around by the time we're independent. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, the, these sort of social engineering uh, uh, things are, are can be difficult to turn around. But the UK has, since the Second World War, went through two periods where it massively changed social attitudes across the whole country. The first was right after the Second World War, when it built up the welfare state from nothing. Um, you might have you might have heard of the, the things that they were doing to do that, including Ive Evans saying he was stuffing the doctors' mouths with gold mm -hmm. to get them to accept the NHS. Um, not suggesting we, 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 we you have to do exactly that, but with a concerted effort, you can change minds. We did it again at the beginning of the eighties when Thatcher tore down everything again. <coughs> both both periods took about five years. So that gives you a time scale of, the, of what, what you need to do if you want to change the mind of a country in a very fundamental way. You can do it. We are proud of, now proud of you know, institutions that at the time of their introductions were derided as being impossible dreams. Honestly, I actually could spend all night talking about that. Um, I am concerned about the proposal it has for currency in an independent Scotland. Um, I'm not keen on the idea of continuing to use the pound unofficially, especially when it's tied to a lot of the fiscal rules that they have applied in the uh, in the report. Um, for a start, I think they are mandating austerity, despite what people say. Um, when you actually look at you know trying to cut. Um, the, the state as a percentage of GDP, if, even if you're doing it in the midst of a rising tide, you're still making cuts uh, to what would be growing demand. Um, I'm very concerned that when they're talking about, oh, we could transition to, transition to an independent currency later, I don't think that would be easy under the rules that they lay out for themselves. Um, so I am quite concerned about it. I, am pro I, I produced quite a detailed paper a couple of weeks ago critiquing um, the, the, the Growth Commission. I'm about to produce another paper sort of promoting our views on currency. We, we, we think an independent Scotland should have an independent currency from day one. Um, I am aware that this is a discussion document. It's not SNP policy at the moment. What I think is going to happen, though, is come the National Assemblies that are being arranged, essentially it'll be folk who, probably like many folk in this room, I don't know what the party affiliations are in this room, but if any of you are at SNP and any of you are going, planning to go to the National Assemblies, I maybe encourage you to hold up both the Growth Commission's plan of things, Commonwealth's plan of things, the plan from the Greens or anyone else who produces a plan, and essentially debate them and pick the one you want. And I think it will come down to autumn conference for branches to put in motions and, and, and state that this is the vision that we want for Scotland. One thing I would state, just as a caveat to that, is one of my concerns about the Growth Commission's plans, especially around its tests, for determining if you can then later at some point produce a Scottish currency yeah. is that they may be very difficult to achieve, they may even be impossible to achieve, in which case what the Growth Commission's plan would do is lock in future governments to a particular future. Mm -hmm. Whereas 
what we've tried to do, at least in our plan, is what we've called a future neutral process. So that yes, we're advocating a, a Scottish currency, but if you want to keep that pegged to the sterling, so that you've got the similar price value, you can. If you want to peg it to the euro, you can. If you want to float it on the market and find its own value, you can. If you want to abandon the sterling, the, the, the Scottish currency, and then sterlingize, <laughs> you can. So you do have options for future governments to explore. Um, so I would, I, I would be, I would be wary of any plan that locks you into a particular future. Well, this is this is you know, the paper I'm writing just now is going to explore kind of what could happen in that. <laughs> the thing about starting a currency is you don't want to rush it. It takes about three years to launch a currency. This is the experience they had with the euro. Mm -hmm. So, if you got to a point, and it could be immediately after independence, it could be five years after, it could be long long after that, and you decide right, circumstances have changed. We need a currency. Now you've got to go through that process of launching one and it takes a minimum of three years to do. It might even take longer because you probably have to pass a bill in Parliament. You might even have to have a constitutional amendment, which means a, a supermajority in Parliament and a referendum in order to say, right, we want a currency. That could take 18 months, uh, two years to arrange, then the three-year build process, so you've got an entire Parliament taken up with that task. Whereas another scenario, if you've taken the time at the start to build a currency on day one, you've pegged it to sterling, Right, you're happy with that, then a big change happens, the central bank could say, right, we're breaking the peg, and they can do that in minutes. Mm -hmm. This happened in Switzerland in um, January 2015. I was actually working in, uh, in currency speculation at, at that point. So <laughs> I, I was sitting in front of my computer, I had the currency charts all around me, big three monitor bank thing, really cool. Uh, <laughs> and nobody knew what was happening, but just all of a sudden, the Swiss franc jumped up and jumped up in value by twenty percent, and everyone was scrabbling around, wondering what's what's happening, what's happening. Phone calls are getting made, and then the news trickled in. Sit the Swiss central bank's broken the peg with the euro. It just happened like that. So that's again what I mean by a future neutral approach, where you can adapt to changes very quickly if you have to. You do it in the period between the referendum and formal independence day. Ah, uh, is that two years? Uh, well, we're saying three years. Two now, years. that sounds a bit long considering we were talking 18 months in 2014. We were talking 18 months in 2014 because we were talking about sharing a lot of institutions with the UK, including the currency. What we are saying is take a bit longer. And anyway, two years is the time they give for Brexit. Even if it had been competently managed, the UK would struggle to negotiate a, a, a Brexit in two years. So we're saying take a bit of time, three years, get everything in right, get everything in place, then on Independence Day we can do what we like and we don't have the, the, the shackles on top of us. Right, I, Ireland, Australia, they did this in a very different time. Mm -hmm. They did it in what, uh, up between the Second World War and 1971, there was a mechanism called Bretton Woods. That effectively, all of the European currencies were pegged to the dollar, and the dollar was backed by gold. So none of these countries had variable exchange rates, and trading was really, really boring between the countries. <laughs> uh, this was also the period for some, some technical reasons, if he's remember. If, any of you remember trying to go on holiday up until the end of the yes, 60s when you yes. could only take a certain amount of holiday money yes, with you? I remember that. Yeah. That was because of that mechanism. Mm -hmm. Now that broke down <coughs> in 1971. Mm -hmm. um, largely, well, the final death knell was Nixon wanted to pay for the Vietnam War, so <laughs> he had to print money to do it. Mm -hmm. um, so he took the dollar off the gold standard. <coughs> um, so you can't directly, it's a very different world. Mm -hmm. uh, the, 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 the world of central banking and, and and money to trading is completely different now. It's not comparable to talk about sterilization now as what it was like in Ireland. Right. Uh, the former Soviet bloc countries, now the Soviet was a federation and each of the, the states within it, actually quite a lot of them already had their own independent banking systems yeah. and their own monetary issue systems. For them it was actually a relatively simple process of, okay we're now independent. Quite a lot of them actually just gathered a bunch of bunch of notes and put ink stamps on them. 
<laughs> to, to tide them over until they could get new ones printed. Uh, so again, it's a somewhat different world. The countries that do this currency substitution thing just now, there's three prominent examples. Ecuador uses the dollar. Montenegro uses the euro. Liechtenstein uses the Swiss franc. Each of these countries have a GDP of about 1% of the currency zone that they are using. Right? Scotland has a GDP of about 8.5% 8 of the sterling zone. So that's quite significant because what happens in a sterlingization process is right now the Bank of England when it wants to make an interest, interest rate decision is considering the whole UK economy when it's doing it, at least in theory. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then it decides if it's moving interest rates up or down. Mm -hmm. If Scotland's independent and not part of that, it's no longer considering the Scottish economy. So if London's booming and we're busting, they'll raise interest rates to cool down the London market and put us into a free, uh, a free spin or the other way around. Mm -hmm. If London's crashing and they drop rates to support London, mm -hmm. then our economy overheats and we have no control over that. Mm -hmm. Even in a currency union, Scotland would have had a representative on the, the board of the, the Bank of England. Mm -hmm. So we'll get probably even less control over our monetary affairs than we do now, mm -hmm. because at least the Bank of England is considering Scotland in its, in its, in its spreadsheets. Yes, this is what are, what are our thoughts on the Scottish Investment Bank? This was actually one of Commonwealth's big successes, I have to say. <clears throat> in 2016, we, we produced the papers on this. Um, took us a bit of effort to, to get them introduced to the party. Um, the, our initial approaches were quite frankly just rebuffed. Um, but we took the show on the road, went around, went around a lot of the SNP branches in particular, but just generally talked about it to a lot of people out in public and behind the scenes, built up, built up a head of steam and it was accepted at a party conference, became policy and is now being launched. We've been in quite close consultation with the folk that are doing it. Um, Benny Higgins is actually a big fan of us, to, to be honest with you. Given, given his background, it was, a, um, it was a little bit of a surprise to me, but a very, very pleasant one. Um, and he, he's, he's doing quite well and set up the structure, so we're quite happy with it. The funding, well, we could say it could get it could do with a little more money than it's getting, but we'll always say that. <laughs> um, what we are now doing is looking at the missions of the bank, because this is a mission-driven bank. So the bank itself will be apart from the political process, with the exception that the, the Scottish Parliament will decide what areas that the bank should focus on at any given time. Um, Right now, it's mostly thinking in terms of small, medium business um, investment and loans. It's more patient and more, more secure than the, the banks are giving. It's a very positive thing. Absolutely applaud it. I do think it could be looking at things like energy policy, like social housing, like a replacement to PFI. Um, so we are producing papers sort of suggesting these missions. With regard to the pilots, most of these pilots have been um, fairly limited studies, usually looking at individuals, in, individual impacts. So they'll be taking people who are on extremely low income or who have been long-term unemployed. The, there have been a couple of pilots where they have taken an entire community and given them the universal basic income. This is known as a saturation study. Now that's where you start to see things like the, the gender equality, the familial equality. The problem is that the, the saturation studies were mostly done in the 60s. These were the ones that were done in, in mm -hmm. Canada. So society has changed quite a lot in the last 50 years. So I'm not sure if the license can be quite applied so well. They did note very, very positive benefits for gender equality and for education. Mm -hmm. You didn't have the, kid, the, the kids dropping out of school so early to get work, for instance. Um, what we need to see now is more of these saturation studies. I'm hoping that, and I have had some positive um, uh, comments along this line, that some of the some of the pilot studies in Scotland are looking at trying to develop a saturation study, so picking a town somewhere and, and applying the, the UBI to the whole town. Um, but the limited data we have it does show very positive benefits in, in that regard. It 
it's this is one of these areas that it's very difficult for someone who's, who's, who's not been in that situation to talk about. That's, that's essentially why I, I, was, I can't talk about it. Um, it, it takes the, the experiences of people like yourself mm -hmm. to, to be able to talk about this more effectively. And I, I do apologise that I haven't talked about it. Right, turns out money, magic money trees actually do exist. Uh, <laughs> right, if you have your own currency and you're an independent country, you have a you have a very different relationship with your national deficit than you do if you're a devolved nation or if you're a country that cannot create its own money. Right. Really, what happens is governments don't tax money and then use it to spend things. Governments create money, spend it into the economy, and then they tax money back out so that they don't end up with too much money flowing into the economy and causing inflation. Right? If you think of, this is where things get a little bit murky, think of your economy as a bucket. So you've got a tap at the top, that's your, that's your government spending money in. You've got a plug at the bottom, that's the money getting drained out via taxes. Right? Balance them because if, it, oh, if, if, the, if the, you spend more money in than you tax out, your bucket overflows, that's inflation. If it hits the bottom, that's a liquidity crisis. Nobody has any money anymore to spend. Right? Then think about trade. Think about your trade deficit. The UK has quite a big trade deficit. That's money getting scooped out of the bucket and thrown overseas. Right? So if you've got a trade deficit, your money is reducing, you need to turn the tap up higher. So you need to start creating money to balance that. That means you're increasing your government deficit, increasing your government debt. If you don't do that, the money has to be created somewhere else. But somewhere else is your credit card. Right? Break it into a slightly more individual example. Imagine you're earning £10,000. You get taxed £2,000 and you spend the rest. Right? The government has that £2,000 and it provides you with £3,000 worth of public services, healthcare. You need £3,000 worth of healthcare. So the government's got a £1,000 deficit. It then says, right, we need austerity. So what we're going to do is privatise the healthcare system. So we no longer pay healthcare. But we're also going to give you a tax cut. So we'll cut your taxes by 2000 So you've got another £2,000 in your pocket. But you still need £3,000 worth of healthcare. So now you've got a £1,000 deficit. That's the impact of austerity right there. You know, the government's been cutting back spending, so you've had to increase it. You have a credit limit. And unlike governments, you start printing money in your living room, you go to jail. <laughs> political choice. It's a political choice to hammer the poor. Because it wins them votes. Because <laughs> they're stuck in an old mindset of the government is a, has a household income model of um, uh, their finances. Um, an interesting thing about the quantitative easing point of view, uh, the Bank of England currently owns a third of the UK's national debt. So the UK pays interest on the national debt, you know, pays the Bank of England the interest money. But the Bank of England's profits are owned by the UK Treasury. So the profit, the, the, the debt interest then goes straight back into Treasury again. Right? The Bank of England, the Bank of England, that, that sterilizes that chunk of the debt. You know, it's, it's like paying rent to your landlord except you own the house. <laughs> um, so the, the, the Bank of England could actually just write off that, that debt. It would cut the UK's national debt from 90% of GDP to 60% of GDP. But then we're told we need austerity because the, the national debt's so high. What happens if a third of it disappears? And then people start asking, well, why do we still need austerity? Purely a political choice. Right, 
after I come back up to do my talk in the, the Growth Commission, could I come back again to give you an entire evening on globalisation, macro, uh, ma uh, macroeconomics and the, the economic trilemma? <laughs> oh, <laughs> it's very, very complex topic and I'm watching the clock there. Um, the Growth Commission actually rejected the idea of capital controls as being too complex in today's globalised world. That doesn't seem to stop Iceland. <laughs> um, they're not popular now because companies who have a lot of power like to be able to move their capital around. Um, they're certainly not popular in the EU rules. They're, they're not blocked but highly discouraged under the Maastricht Treaty. Um, but maybe we, as we are rethinking our, our relationship with money, rethinking our relationship with globalisation, Maybe we need to rethink our, our relationship with macro macroeconomic tools like capital controls. You know, these are, we, we have used all these tools before. They're not new things. Governments use them routinely within living memory. They can be pulled out of the cupboard again. So it's a different world we'd create by doing it, but you know, maybe we need a different world. Do you really want a lecture of the benefits of a properly robust statistics agency? <laughs> <laughs> we have a full library of policies and we are promoting as many of them as we can. Yeah, uh, yeah if you go to our website, allofusfirst.org, go to hit the library button, we have years worth of archives on virtually, I mean, we, you see, there's a lot of topics we barely scratch the surface in, but we cover such a broad area that we, we do what we can with our, our resources. Um, but I think we're, I hope we're developing interesting ideas in a lot of different things. Something that we're working on over the summer is uh, revolutionizing, revolutionizing social housing using the National Investment Bank. Um, basically, we want to build, we want to start building passively heated houses. I don't know if you've heard of um, this this kind of thing. Uh, there's a couple of a couple of them built in Scotland. Um, how would you like a house that costs almost nothing extra to build? but has a, an annual heating cost of something on the order of £50. Mm -hmm. Yep, thought you'd like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Why aren't we building these? <laughs> the technology exists. It's not, it's, it really is a, it's a design thing rather than a technology thing. So we're going to be lobbying hard to increase building regulations to make these things, make it basically illegal to build at less than mm -hmm. passive standards or near mm -hmm. passive standards. And we want to start building enough social housing that anyone who wants one can get one.